David Ball, Regional Director for Australia at New Zealand with Lockheed Martin Space. Thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. G'day, Chris. It's great uh, great to have some time with you today. Thank you. Nice. Uh, ANZ Regional Director, but I understand you're there in Colorado, uh, and that, that is Lockheed Martin Space Headquarters. Is that correct? Yes, it is. We have a number of facilities in the Denver area, and I'm most over here doing some meetings this week. And so... Looking forward to getting back to Australia where the temperature's above zero. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm in Sydney, so it's not too bad today. Um, yeah. Look, Lockheed Martin is always one of those, uh, it's an astounding company. It's the biggest uh, sort of defence contractor to the US uh, as well. And I was there with Lockheed Martin in 2012, I believe. I did a media tour. So I've got, I've got the breadth and, and the scope of Lockheed Martin. It's, uh, as I mentioned, across all domains, uh, but space uh, is a bit of a standout for Lockheed uh, and how it integrates with the other technologies that it's involved with. Maybe we'll start with your role, Lockheed Martin Space, but for Australia, what's your key sort of role, uh, uh, sort of focus, I suppose, is what the the, the aspect of, and how that you know, links back into Lockheed Martin Space globally. Okay, thanks, Chris. So my role in Australia in uh, looking after the Australian New Zealand markets is really to look after our existing business in country today uh, that we're involved in with various customers. And then importantly, grow our team, grow our involvement and engagement with, with industry. And it's really important to us that local industry engagement piece, but then look at pursuing our other opportunities, new businesses and so forth. And uh, we recently would have seen us sign the South Pan Agreement with Geoscience Australia, a joint initiative of the Australian and New Zealand governments. and we're very pleased to be operating that service in this region. But uh, from an overall view, we've been in country as LMA space for about 20 years. Uh, we have a facility up in Northern New South Wales that does launch and early orbit uh, support for satellites being launched, uh, but also a number of existing businesses and services to other customers. So you are part of Lockheed Martin Australia uh, for space, right. and then obviously that links into Lockheed Martin uh, International. Yeah, Lockheed Martin Australia has uh, has all four business areas uh, represented in country. Our aeronautics business, our rotary mission, rotary mission systems organisation, missiles and fire control, and space. And we're all involved in various activities in country. And the LMA organisation provides that umbrella uh, for engagement with the customer and government affairs and all the back office support elements. But my role specifically reports through the global business area of LM space back to the headquarters here in Colorado. Nice. Now for the audience, SouthPan is the Southern Positioning Augmentation Network contract. It's a $1.18 billion contract uh, with the Australian government. Uh, maybe just talk us through what that is involving and uh, the significance of it. Sure, thanks. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly large contract. It's a long duration contract too. So under the contract, we'll establish and then maintain and operate the network for, for our customer. The, the intention behind the, the contract is to provide augmentation to GNSS or GPS and Galileo signals that we use today on our iPhones and, and other phones. And it's to supplement the accuracy of GPS and also in, in a phase we're implementing currently to improve the integrity of that GPS signal. So to think about using navigation services today, the current service provides about a you know, five to 10 meter accuracy, but it's not of a known integrity bound. So under, under the South Pan service, we'll install certain infrastructure around Australia and a couple of overseas locations to provide a correction signal to that GPS that'll be processed in Australia and at the second site in New Zealand that will bring the accuracy down to five to 10 centimetres. Right. So it's a marked improvement in accuracy. And in other capabilities, it's also going to put an integrity bound around it. As I mentioned, so you know horizontally and vertically exactly where you are within a certain tolerance. And the main user there is the aviation sector, that they can then have, uh, have precision and confidence in their vertical position on landing approach. And this is used at airports where there are no navigation aids. So Melbourne and Sydney airports, for example, have very robust, um, complicated systems of landing aids for the for pilots. If you take that to a remote and rural setting, 
such as where the Royal Flying Doctor Service is operating or where mining companies are landing some reasonably large aircraft into, into airfields which don't have those support facilities, that turns that airfield into one with that capability to go down to 200 feet decision height, make a decision on landing or, or abort the landing. And that you think about bad weather situations, that enables pilots to perhaps secure a landing where otherwise they might not be able to. In particular for Royal Flying Doctor Service, that might enable them to get in somewhere to treat a patient or get a patient out back to, back to a major hospital. It's really interesting as you start thinking through an SBAS service or space-based augmentation service like SouthPan, what are the other applications that are going to come out? Aviation is but one. You think about precision agriculture, automated transportation systems, where you have an integrity bound around it and you can use driverless transportation systems with confidence that you know exactly where everything else is, where the edge of the road is, where road signs are, where, where traffic signals are. And you think about it for, you know, for example, mining sites, where we have large open cut, mi cut mining sites today with autonomous trucks in them, enabling them to operate with greater accuracy and also know where the people are. So there's a geofencing around activities in mining sites. So pretty excited by the project, as you can tell. Uh, we're we're uh, very, very honoured to be able to operate that for both governments and already up in service with the initial capability now. Well, what, what's the sort of the feedback back into the Australian industry? I understand uh, it involves ground-based systems as well. There was a contract signed with Avcom, uh, a New South Wales business here. Yes. What's the, what's the sort of flow-on effect for the Australian space sector? Well, there's some, some good flow-on effects. You mentioned Avcom will be a, a primary subcontractor under the, under the service to help install the large antennas in Australia and New Zealand that we'll use to communicate. With the, uh, with the spacecraft that Geoscience Australia will, will acquire. And then there's a ground network of correction stations across Australia and New Zealand and in some overseas locations. So all the terrestrial communications back from those ground reference stations back to the correction stations. Um, it's a fairly complicated network. There's some very specialised system engineering work which is going with a couple of our technology partners internationally to bring that technology to Australia and help help uh, develop the Australian capability. Uh, one of the other things I think is interesting is you think about the terminal side of things, and that's not in our scope of capability, but you will see the market respond in terminal capabilities for user communities, either on you know, mo mobile platforms like the agricultural machinery or handheld services, yeah. uh, depending on application. Um, and I suppose the other aspect to that is uh, that that, that linkage to your, does it link back to your traffic management system in, in your air traffic management system? Is that part of the overlay of that as well? No, it's not part of our scope. Uh, that will be between Geoscience Australia and Air Services Australia and Airways New Zealand are their ultimate customers for the service. There'll be, there'll be arrangements between the government agencies in that regard. Fair enough. I suppose the other aspect, what we're seeing, uh, a lot of discussion around AUKUS at the moment. We've got a UK-Australia space bridge as well. How, how much is that impacting? I know it's not related to South Pan, but sort of overlaying uh, the space sector. Is there much there for the space community to be looking at in relation to AUKUS? Well, I think with, with AUKUS, you've got to look at what, what initiatives the three governments will make in the, under that umbrella, and I'm not going to predict... Uh, government decisions in this regard, but there are tremendous benefits we'll gain through interoperability with those key allies. Uh, and you'll see messaging from government in all areas of the, of the AUKUS arrangement as they go forward. Fair enough. What are, what's your general observations of the Australian space sector? You've been in the uh, industry for Australia for many, many years. I won't, won't give your age away too much, but Thank you. Uh, you're obviously seeing a lot more discussion, uh, a lot more noise. I, we certainly have uh, over the last sort of five years or so since the Australian Space Agency uh, was formed. But yeah, your general observations, you're the former chair of the Space Industry Association as well. Yeah. Your key observations yeah. over the last sort of five years or so. Yeah, thanks, Chris. It's, it's been a really interesting journey since, since I got out of the Air Force, you know, say many years ago, to join the space sector in Australia and went through those long, year, lean years before we had an agency established. And you referred to the Space Industry Association of Australia there. I was treasurer for a long time and 
I remember back in the days where we had 20 members and a few thousand dollars in the bank, and now we got to the point where we're able to uh, be the host for the International Astronautical Congress in 2017 in Adelaide. And that was a tremendously successful event, and I think really helped open the eyes of Australia and the Australian government and other other areas of industry to the fact that there is a substantial space industry to be had. We then subsequently saw government establish the agency, and that's really become a focal point trigger for industry to to start to create capabilities. We've seen a number of startups in country, and it's been really exciting to see that inspirational focus for industry as we as we grow the sector. So we've seen that on the upstream side with with folks who are building launch vehicles, launch facilities, building satellites themselves. We've seen some great achievements recently in that regard. But also you think about the downstream. What applications do we run over these new services and new new facilities in space? What do you do how to process the data, uh, exploit the data and leverage communication services, navigation services, Earth observation services, weather, Ultimately, the agency is looking at human spaceflight endeavours. So it really has excited the industry. And I think in turn, for us, it's really great to see that the kids getting excited about studying engineering and science and technology subjects and going to the space sector. But the space sector is broader than just the engineering technology. I say that as a reformed engineer, that uh, we we see the tech side of things, but also the, the whole support tail. Project, project management, financial folks, all across the organisation to impose, is needed to make the sector run. So it's a pretty exciting time in my view. And what advice would you give to the to the industry, particularly either for either startups or those coming into the industry? Um, sort of a two-pronged uh, question is, uh, where do you see Australia's strengths uh, in, in a global sort of space sector? Where, where, do, you, where do we stand out? Yeah, a couple of interesting ones there. I think you look at the fact that we've just established the space agency, and you know, other agencies are fifty or so years old. We we've got the ability to start with a fairly blank canvas and create new technology, new capabilities, new facilities that are designed and tailored for where technology and evolution is today. So it enables us to leapfrog certain activities to take that forward-looking stance with the latest and greatest technology. But also you think about Australia's geography, where we are in the world as, a, as a, you know, you know, an AUKUS nation, as you talked about earlier, in the Southern Hemisphere, that's something our other AUKUS partners don't have and other Western countries don't have. So we have the Southern Hemisphere basing and geography. Our east to west coast um, spacing gives us tremendous view of different parts of the orbit for space domain awareness and communications connectivity. So we're, we're really well placed as a nation to have some key advantages and, and uh, capabilities that we go forward with. Anything on the technology side? Uh, you know, we've got some quantum uh, research happening, uh, some others have potentially launch capability as well. Any other standouts from a technology uh, viewpoint? Yeah, we've got some really great material sciences work going on here very uh, world-leading astronomy research that's been done over years, and that's key to our ability to tap into the space sector. You mentioned uh, the quantum side of things, which is growing in leaps and bounds. It's this ultimate technical um, spread in terms of the areas that we're well well advanced in. And because we don't have that legacy infrastructure to maintain, you can be more efficient where you make your investments in new new great services. You mentioned Lord's Vehicles. Some great activities going on there. We've seen New Zealand as well as Australia yeah. uh, do some great episodes there. Uh, ELA in Northern Territory had their maiden launch last year. Uh, we have we'll look at South Australia. We'll get their maiden launch done very soon. And it's just great to see where some of the launch vehicle manufacturing is going with companies like Gilmore Space out of Queensland. We saw Skycraft recently recently out of Canberra launch five satellites. and it's three hundred kilograms. The total launch mass, which is the largest uh, launch mass of an Australian-made space object uh, in the history of this industry. So companies like that are doing some great evolutionary work, which is terrific for us. 
Wonderful. Well, look, we've got Avalon 2023 coming up. Yes, in just, I think yes. I just interviewed uh, Amda CEO the other day. So there's only less than 20 days left. What's your outlook for 2023? What's your fo- your general focus uh, for this year? Your focus for this year, once we um, get through Avalon, we'll have all four of our business areas very prominently uh, engaged at Avalon across the organisation. But then as we go forward, there's a number of initiatives and projects we're working on uh, with government and with other parts of the industry. And we look forward to bringing those to fruition. Of course, South Pan journey has just begun for us. We've got the initial service up and now we're working closely with our customer and our tech partners to implement the, the latest stages of the project. So a lot to be done on existing work, but looking forward to, looking forward to more engagement with industry locally and with STEM engagement, working with academia to understand how we can support research and help to take that research back overseas. Uh, we also work closely with supply chains here with manufacturers to take them into our space supply chain. The company's done that very effectively in the aeronautics business under F-35 and the C-130. I think it's about 50 Australian companies with you know, $2.5 billion of exports today yeah. and growing, obviously, as those platforms continue. We have some small steps in the space area where we're taking in Australian manufacturers in our supply chain for them to become a standard product in our space supply chain over the long term. And that's key for us is to be a long term player, long term engager with industry and country. So well, look, plenty you, on the agenda for 2023. I was going to say uh, there is a lot to keep up and I was going to say how do, how do people best reach out to you, but I just think uh, probably the first start would be to go to Avalon, uh, otherwise Absolutely. be within your network anyway. Uh, the website is lockheedmartin.com. That is the place to start. Uh, and then you can drill down from there. You'll get a sense as I started out with the uh, the breadth and scope of Lockheed Martin Australia and obviously Lockheed Martin International. So David Ball, the Regional Director for Australia New Zealand for Lockheed Martin Space. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today on Australia in Space TV. Thank you, Chris. Great to speak and uh, enjoy it. Look forward to seeing you at Avalon. Great to have you from Colorado as well at the time. Thanks, <laughs> Thank mate. You. Cheers. Thanks, see you.